Attention listeners, do you ever find yourself struggling to decide what to watch on a Saturday night when you're in the mood for horror? Or perhaps you're trying to round out your own horror film education. In either case, I'm sure you'll be able to make some great discoveries in my 10x10 horror watch list, featuring a breakdown of the 10 favorite horror movies from 10 renowned horror directors. We did a deep dive of the favorite horror movies from directors including Guillermo del Toro, Ari Aster, Jordan Peele, Quentin Tarantino, James Gunn, Rob Zombie, Martin Scorsese, and many, many more. Here you'll find a collection of each director's favorite horror movies, along with quotes about what they appreciated about the films, all in an easy-to-reference PDF that you can download absolutely free. Featuring a mix of well-worn classics and deep cuts, hopefully you'll discover some overlooked gems and look at old classics through new lenses. Download the 10x10 Horror Watch List for free by visiting nicktaylor.com slash horror guide. That's nicktaylor.com slash horror guide. One last thing before we begin, and this is my email newsletter, The Howl. The Howl is a monthly rundown of the latest horror news along with my hand-picked movie recommendations, updates from the show, and cool stuff I've recently discovered, all in one quick read email delivered to your inbox only once a month. Easy to read, easy to sign up for, and easy to cancel. Join the Howl newsletter by visiting nicktaylor.com slash the howl. That's nicktaylor.com slash the howl. Welcome back to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. As always, each episode of the Nick Taylor Horror Show explores how today's horror filmmakers are getting their movies made while deconstructing their methods and career strategies into practical insights that you can use on your own horror filmmaking journey. This includes creative processes, funding resources, favorite books and tools, key life lessons, and much, much more. Judaic demonology has carved out its niche as a legitimate horror subgenre, with entries like 2019's The Vigil, Sam Raimi's The Possession, 2022's Lullaby, and most recently, The Offering. Set in a Brooklyn Hasidic enclave, the film draws its plot from the Jewish folktale of Abizu, a female demon blamed for miscarriages and infant mortality. Shot on a relatively low budget, the offering is a pretty riveting horror drama that showcases really great character building, really good performances, and stunning cinematography, ultimately making this an undeniably impressive debut for our guest today, director Oliver Park. Oliver Park is a British horror writer and director best known for his short films Vicious and Still, both of which have been praised by fans and critics alike. The Offering is his first feature and is now streaming on Hulu. In this conversation, we delve into Oliver's directorial origin story, the making of The Offering, and an exploration of what it means to be a scholar of fear. Please enjoy this conversation with Oliver Park. Why don't we start with this? The opening shot of the movie we were discussing earlier, and uh, it's a really powerful prologue. And um, it uh, it's what you called an impossible shot. So can you tell us more about that opening shot and the, the care and the thinking that went into it? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So I, I believe that in any story, I think, you know, the opening is... It always needs to give you a flavor of, of what's to come, but I like to try and summarize the, the entire story in one shot if I can, mm. because especially within horror, it's all about what it's all about expectations and right. using those against the audience, sometimes giving in and, and things like that. And it was important to me to find a really cinematic uh, and moving opening shot that also told you something about the tone or the story. Right. And ultimately, the opening shot tells you straight away: don't trust what you think you see. Mm. So uh, we gave you that up front. <laughs> so if the ending made you jump or you were um, you didn't see the twist coming, we told you it was coming in the opening shot. But one thing that was really important to us was that we were using this uh, this power of the uh, the demon, which is that it's able to melt texts. And you know, obviously, the, 
in the beginning there was the word, the word of God, and this is a demon that melts these religious texts. And we wanted to basically just be looking at the beginning, the word, the ink mm. itself, and see what's to come, which is what brought this whole story together, which is the um, the kind of the, the ritualistic symbols all over the walls, and the story of this man who has essentially gone to the real depths to, to bring his wife back to life. Spoilers. So the opening shot is we open on an upside down corridor leading us to the room where everything took place. And then we realize we're looking in a puddle. A droplet drops and then it ripples as we tilt up and we realize we weren't looking at the real thing. We were looking at a puddle and within our story, reflections don't lie. Mm. So in order to achieve that, we realized pretty early on we were not going to have the budget to do this CG. Mm -hmm. And if you if you ever put a mirror on the floor, you'll realize you can't see the floor in the mirror. You can't see the ground in the reflection of a puddle. Right. So that was our first thing to overcome is the idea of how do we look into this this reflection all in one shot without doing CG to to achieve this shot. And uh, myself and my production designer, Philip Murphy, and my my camera uh, my camera team, and, and Lorenzo, the cinematographer and DP, we we spent a while trying to figure out how we were going to do this technically. And I think at one point someone suggested we what we do is we just tilt the entire set. Mm. I think someone laughed and said, Whoa. "When you're Chris Nolan, you can tilt sets." <laughs> but. Uh, Ultimately, we didn't do that, but we did find a way to to get the image. I won't spoil how we actually did it. You'll have to wait until the behind the scenes come out All for right. that. But it was a, it was a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, certainly the um, the most technical shot of the movie. Yeah, and I, I think there's something so respectable about going to such lengths to do something that the audience might not necessarily notice consciously, con consciously, but their mind's eye probably subconsciously realizes there's something amiss about this shot. There's something that doesn't follow, you know, the laws of physics or whatever the case may be, you know? And I think it's, it's absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's a great thing. Again, it's the great thing about um, horror in general or, or any of these things you can play with expectations and you can really unsettle people. You mm -hmm. can make people feel things without, without doing a lot. Uh, you know, one of my favorite things to do in horror as I did, somewhat in this film and a lot more in my short films is just just slowly holding on a bedroom door or any kind of door where it's dark beyond because ultimately i suppose the storytellers will never be able to scare you the audience as much as your own fears can right but all i need to do is just remind you that you have fear and you're going to put your own demons inside that room interesting yeah, what was your approach to crafting the fear factors of this movie? Because it was chilling throughout, and it also had a very palpable drama, you know, at the heart of it. One of my litmus tests for how good a horror movie is, not all of them, but certain ones. If you take the horror element out, does the story and the characters and the overall drama actually work? And in this case, you know, absolutely, easily could have been a, a drama, a demon-free yeah. drama, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, what was the approach to crafting the horror element? Because there was a level of sophistication to it. It was very chilling. There was a lot of dread. It didn't rely on jump scares. However, it does deliver the goods at the same time. So, like, what was the approach to making it scary? Because it's challenging to do that these days. Absolutely. Well, I think looking at genre just um, in a nutshell for a moment, I think if you look at a horror movie, you can say, well, just you know, fill it with, with jumps and make it really scary and story doesn't matter and characters don't matter and, and all this all this stuff you hear all the time. And I think for a thrill ride, for a roller coaster, absolutely you can do that. But at the same time, if you're telling a story, then you know fear is derived, fear is earned through character. You might hear someone say that you're only as scared as the characters on the screen, and to some mm -hmm. extent that is true. So I think one hundred percent story comes first. The fear comes from the fear within your characters. Ultimately, you need to know what most likely to scare the audience as well. I think you need to know how to use the tricks and the tools that you have at your disposal within horror. Yeah. One of my favorite things to do is to make the audience think you're going to do one thing and then just simply just not do it. Mm -hmm. And that's it's great because you can do that in comedy and horror, and that's basically it. <laughs> Set up at a banana skin halfway down the street that someone's walking down, and ultimately then they just walk straight by the banana. And they don't slip. Mm -hmm. That's what you know. You can do in in horror, in scary ways, and 
that's how I approach horror in general is my job is to scare you. So away from taking you through the drama of the story and telling the story of the characters from a horror perspective, yeah. my job is 100% to keep you unsettled, to unnerve you, to scare you in the moment and give you things to take home with after you've seen the movie. Mm. So a lot of my ideas are inspired by my nightmares, right? which good or bad, I have often. So I will now, thankfully, I've kind of gotten used to them to some extent, and I'll wake up in a cold sweat and spend the next hour just writing down what I just <laughs> dreamt of, because my my nightmares are pretty cinematic, and I, I love my mind for giving me that. So one of the things that I did for the pitch for the offering, when they were looking for people to direct, I had a meeting with the studio, and I told them I had really scary nightmares, and they said, oh, can you tell us about one of them? So I did. And this particular nightmare ended up in the movie. Whoa. So I, before I worked in film, I worked in architecture. That's actually what I studied. Mm -hmm. And I had a dream one night that I was architecturally surveying the crypt of a church. And I was measuring it up and I had my camera with me and there was one room that I couldn't get into. It was at the end of this long kind of underground tunnel. There was this big iron door and I was desperate to try and get in this door. But it was late, the door was locked, so I gave up. And I started walking away, and then behind me I heard this creak. So I turn around, and this door is now open, and it's dark inside. And because I'm an idiot, and because I was dreaming, I decided to go in the room. So I walk into this enormous chamber, and on the other side of the room there's these huge stained glass windows, stairs going up to a second floor that I didn't even know existed. And throughout this whole chamber there were statues covered in sheets. Well. To the left of me, there was this enormous double wooden door leading outside. And I looked around. The sun was already set at this point. I knew I didn't have time to measure up this room. So I thought, I'm just going to have to... I'm going to run over to the window, tap on the window and tell my colleague who was outside having a smoke to come inside and see this room. Meanwhile, I won't measure the room. I'll just take photos. Mm -hmm. And this is what inspired the, the photography scene in the movie, The Offering. So I try and take photos of the space. Yep all the while being very unnerved by these sheet-covered statues. And the camera wouldn't take photos. It was almost as if it was too afraid to take any photos. Mm. I tried to suppress the kind of the button, and it wouldn't focus. So I changed to manual focus. That didn't work. Wow. So ultimately, I switched to video mode and very slowly just scan the hall with video mode. And as I'm scanning, I can see on the tiny screen on the back of my camera, audio is being recorded in the silence. So again, because I'm an idiot and because I was dreaming, I stopped recording, I hit playback, put the camera to my ear, and I heard this horrendous, Ooh. so loud in my ear. And at this point, my colleague comes through the double doors from outside and looks up behind me as I feel this horrifying black shroud just grow behind me, grow and grow and grow. She screams with fear, runs back outside straight into the road, at which point a truck smashes into her, oh, killing shit. her instantly. The doors <laughs> slam shut, and I'm left in the dark. That's when I woke up. Whoa. The detail in that dream is incredible. These, this is, that's, I mean, that's an invitation to one of my nightmares. These happen quite often. And this is where I mean, my, my parents say the first horror story I wrote was when I was just three years old, when I said I didn't want to go to bed because the shadow people were going to take me away. Wow. So. Yeah. That was my next question. Like, did you have a lot of nightmares as a kid? Yeah, I always have. And I, I started writing them down and I, I guess I never really, from a filmmaking perspective, I never it was always a dream of mine to work in storytelling and work in horror. Yep. I think the first job I ever wanted was to do special effects in horror movies. Yep. That's I think what I was about, kids want to do. Yeah. I think I was about, I don't know, seven or eight or something really super young. And um, then I just kept writing and it developed from there. And I realized that the interesting thing about horror or any genre movie to that, to, to that matter, a lot of it comes down to the execution, no mm -hmm. pun intended. <laughs> of the, the you know the way you shoot it and the way you play it out and i think that when you're writing you're trying to convey an idea to someone or when you're pitching someone an idea you're really trying to make them understand why it's scary why you feel it from a, a visceral sense and why mm -hmm. why there's a metaphor in there why it's being told 
And that's really, really difficult to do. So I think someone who's able to marry the, the kind of the writing style with the visual style, I think that's a rarity. Yeah. I didn't write the offering. I worked very closely with the fantastically talented Hank Hoffman, who was the writer. And one of his jobs when he was younger was working in a morgue, watching over dead bodies. Mm. So I could talk to Hank endlessly. And we did hours and hours and hours on the phone because he was in LA and I was in England. And just talking about what scared him and me trying to then, you know, go off to bed and try and have nightmares about his fears and the, the traumatic events that led to inspiring the offering. That's really cool. And it sounds like, I mean, I feel like one of the reasons the movie was able to be so effective is a lot of its material from what I'm hearing from you came from very real places. The eeriness of working in a morgue, your nightmares, which there's something about dreams that are so effective and so subconsciously, like effortlessly, sometimes they're like, you know, silly dreams, but like scary dreams, even when you share them with other people, they can kind of feel what you were feeling in a way. There's something about dreams and the subconscious or whatever is happening there that really cuts really deep. And you can kind of tell when movies are based on people's dreams. Like, I feel like David Lynch does that a lot. Obviously, Kurosawa <laughs> would do that. Yeah. But there's like specificity of like tone and eeriness and details that are like this could only have come from some, you know, otherworldly place where, you know, dreams came from. But that coupled with the real experience, I mean, I think there's something about I think one of the things that really stood out about the movie was the authenticity and believability of it. It just felt very, very real. Um, and I guess, yeah, the question that might come out of this rant is um the, it's the world and the characters, everything felt so lived in. All of the character relationships felt very real. Like you could tell there was history between the father and son. And uh, was um, was Hamish the main character's brother or uncle? I wasn't able to. Neither. Oh, he's neither. No, neither. No, he he obviously is an old friend. Oh, from okay. When they were, from so when they were younger. But no, he was always. He worked for Saul, and they were they are essentially okay. brothers. So you could look at them as brothers. I like that people get, the, you know, get the feeling that they are brothers when when they're not. They they are just friends who uh, you know Hamish. Although he's seen as somewhat of a villain, he's really the only honest one. Oh, I think he was the moral movie. center never, of the whole movie. Yeah, yeah. exactly, one hundred percent. Yeah, and he just loves Saul like a father. Hence the reason why he rips the left side of his shirt during Shiva, because mm. that's usually reserved for, for family. And he tries to do what's best. He doesn't trust Art. And we know at that point exactly why he doesn't trust him and you know why he shouldn't trust him. But ultimately, Art isn't doing... <sighs> The um, I don't know. The jury's out on whether or not Art is doing the wrong thing mm, for right. the right reason or the right thing for the wrong reason. Huh. It's it's one of those things where ultimately he isn't a bad guy. He's doing his best. He has been through an awful lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. A lot happened in that house. And there was even more in the deleted scenes and the script. There were backstories written for all the characters. It was phenomenal, the, you know, the level of detail that Hank went to. And I think that's why it's so authentic, because these characters were, were real. Yeah. This script was being in the process of written for six and a half, seven years. This was before i even came on board yeah so it was it was it was fantastic to see such depth such richness in the characters you can see yosla the man who dies in the opening scene you can see his whole life in that apartment mm -hmm. and oh, that's yeah. the point you can pause the movie at any given point and just like you said in dreams there's a hidden depth there uh -huh. and there's hidden there are hidden messages by the way in what's written on the walls go back and look at the fridge magnets which are in hebrew or you know the light flickering in Morse code, you can you well, can see a lot more than what's just being told to you on the screen. Well, I think that's the interesting thing that I love to dig into is the comprehensiveness of the movie because you just felt watching it that every detail was agonized over. And as a viewer, at least first time viewer, you're probably missing seventy five percent of it. But between the sets, the sets looked so real and so lived in. I was convinced you were in somebody's house. But um, I guess the big overarching question is how did you, and you partially answered this, but like how did you create such a authentic and realistic world? Well, let's start with the actors. Their relationships felt 
ancient. You know, they felt very real. And the chemistry between just about every major relationship was extremely believable in the way the actors related to each other. So what was your approach with the actors in terms of like, did you do rehearsals? I know there were backstories written, but how did you get the actors prepared? And how did you get these performances out of them? Well, the the one of the few good things about COVID was that not much was in production and we filmed in the heart of COVID 2021 first thing 2021 so we got to reach out to people to see if they were interested in being a part of the project so we could actually reach out to people like Alan Corduna who is an absolute veteran and Paul Kay and you know Nicholas Blood yeah all these people were basically and Wiseman were just it was all it was just it was right place right time with the fact that they were available they yeah. were fantastic and they already had connections to the world mm -hmm. so they they knew hebrew or in the case of nick who plays arthur it was important for us to find someone who felt like they weren't part of this world anymore mm. uh, maybe they were at one point but they were kind of coming back and it was just everything lined up perfectly yeah and we didn't get a lot of rehearsal time we always i think as as a director i always want more rehearsal time but unless a script is devised with the cast it's just becoming less and less than i'm seeing mm. and i did everything i could to spend as much time with the with the cast as possible they had their backstories like we said and they're i can't say any more than they are literally just rock stars at their craft because ultimately yeah. they're not there to necessarily have rehearsals over and over again they're there to act they're there to make us believe yeah that they are in love with who they're saying they're in love with or this relationship between alan and nick Sol and art has you know gone back 30 years or so when they only met uh a day before we started shooting mm, my god yeah, there was some magic happening there. I mean, I'm trying to dig deeper into how, because it's. I've seen directors have a really good cast and still the performances fall flat. Um, but there's such tension and there's such, you know, meaning in every interaction. So I guess what was, how were you able to create the conditions on set where these actors were able to do their best work? Was there any process with working with the actors? I'm sure they all have different processes, yeah. but as a director, essentially, how were you able to either get out of the way and let them do their best work or bring the best work out of them? It was really important to me from the get go to everyone I was working with closely, whether that was one of the heads of department or Hank, the writer or any of the actors, I needed to know them as best I could so that I could work with them. So mm. that my, I saw my job when I was on set to make sure everything's running smoothly, as in, you know, make sure these puzzles are being solved, make sure we can tell the story in the authentic way and keep the kind of the crux of Hank's, you know, idea, the seed of his idea from the get-go. I wanted to make sure that was real. But then for the actors, it was mainly about making sure they felt safe and they had the the space and the time to do what they needed to do. Mm -hmm. So some actors would prepare beforehand and bring it and they would nail it on the first take. Other actors would ask, can you just, just can you, are you able to just leave the camera rolling and I'm just going to give you a few versions of this or I'm just going to keep going. And Nick at one point, when he's doing the, the crying scene near the middle of the movie, there's a, there's a bit where he, he loses control and he, you know, breaks down and he cries we just left the camera rolling. Mm. I said, you know, to him, is that exactly what he needs? We found, um, yeah, we found that line where he just worked perfectly, where you just, someone like Nick will keep going. And yeah. He, he just didn't stop. So that take of him, I think crying goes on for about 15 minutes, I think. And it's a, it's a very long take and there's lots in there. And then there's other actors like Paul K loves to improvise. And I absolutely championed that as much as I could. Yeah. With a toothpick in your mouth as well, and the fact that there's lots of movement to his character, it may make the edit slightly harder. But we got so much fantastic performance out of just that, um, you know, that ability he has to to feel free. And I think that's my, yeah, that's paramount to me for an actor. I want them to feel 100% safe and free know that i trust them if they've got an idea i want them to do it mm -hmm. we're not going to run out of film it's being shot on digital yeah and we did not fall behind 
on what one, one day we fell behind and that's because of the the two doors in the morgue at one point they fly open and they smash and uh, that was the only day we fell behind because we couldn't get the door one of the doors would not open fully so it oh, kept sh- getting stuck before it hit the wall so one would smash and the other wouldn't and we did that about seven times but <laughs> the the main thing for me was giving the cast time i saw an interview with I think it was Fincher, David Fincher once, and he was talking about the idea that you're spending all this money on a movie and you're spending all this money on flying people out to your country and putting them up in hotels only to get them out as quickly as you possibly can. You know, you spend all this money and then you've got this actor and you rush them through. And these people are trained and they're artists and they can 100% bring it for, we've only got one take of this, they can do it. But if you give them more space, and more time, they can add layers They can do more. And then it's just about finding the balance of how much time you've got with who you're working with on that particular day. I feel like that's enormous. And I feel like it's not talked about enough. The notion of time being your greatest currency in terms of performances. So I guess to to go structural in terms of that idea, how has that worked out with your crew? Because I've been on crews and the AD is like, all right, we got 15 minutes. Boom, let's go. Like how... What was the culture of that and how are you able to create this environment on a technical level with your crew, with your AD, you know, with everybody else? Because usually it's go, go, go. And that is yeah. anathema for good performances. So, it is. Yeah. You're 100%. And it is go, go, go. And I think that's why you, there was, there's a middle ground. It isn't just about saying to, I didn't at any point say to the actor, we've got all day. So just take your time, that kind of thing. But when we're shooting, it's important to me to push back against the AD. I am saying, look, we can it it's going to take us however many minutes to set up the next shot it's going to take us no minutes to just roll again or don't cut mm, mm-hmm. i think that you know ultimately luckily i had my editor there on set so he was doing the assembly cut while we were shooting whoa and that gives you it's almost like you know edgar wright level of um <laughs> tools to play with because it means he he's seeing the edit in his head as was i as we were going and we had an incredible you know lorenzo as a as a dp is just a phenomenon to work with so he was also be able to say oh while we're here let's get this or while we're here we can do this and it's much faster yeah so it was it was a fantastic space to work in because everyone was top of their game Mm -hmm. we never felt rushed I didn't. I wanted it to be a peaceful set. Mm. I, you know, I'm heavy into meditation. I meditated beforehand every single day, and I wanted to make sure the actors knew that it was a safe place and they didn't feel rushed because that's only when they can create their best performances. Yeah. But they also they know how film sets work. They've done all of them have done more films than I have. So they were able to teach me things and they also they knew how it worked they knew how it worked working with new directors they were expe- I, they said a couple of times they were expecting me to just lose control and not be able to do this but keeping a clear head is for me the most important thing you can do on a film set because it's okay you're going to get through it as long as you just keep going mm-hmm. i i'm not really i mean i'm i'm lucky in that i don't get angry very easily but on set, there's you know 250 people there. Everyone's running around. COVID's making it a nightmare. Yeah. And everyone is about ready to snap. But if you as the director are confident and you stay calm, if something comes up and people are getting angry about it, arguing back and forth, that doesn't solve the problem. We've, we're only running out of time. Let's solve the problem. And let's, let's have this fight later on over dinner when we've wrapped today. Yeah. But for now, stop step back and get what you need to from that moment to tell the story. Yeah. Scorsese does transcendental meditation and he says it totally helps him and he'll, he'll do it in the middle. He'll do it first thing in the morning. Then he'll do it like later at night in the shoot. He says he won't do a shoot without doing it because it calms him and enables him to be rational during all of this chaos, which I think a lot of that just sets the tone for the set. So I think that's super duper smart. Yeah. Would love to get into your background. So how essentially did you get your start in film? I know shorts were a big part of your origin story. Could you tell us how you got to this point? Absolutely, yeah. So as I said, I was working in architecture 
mm-hmm. before I, I started making short films. But so from from as long as I can remember, I've been writing these these short stories and scripts and designing horror mazes and basically just doing a deep dive into fear. I consider myself a student of fear. Mm. And within that, I got to a point with within architecture where I just I knew a couple of friends who were making indie movies and I was really excited by horror short films at the time uh, mine and I did a bunch of research and I realized there was a couple of things that, that I personally was missing from these horror shorts at the time so I thought well I've got these horror scripts I'm writing these horror stories and I've got all these ideas so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each horror script I have I'm going to truncate it into a short script. And my plan was to make one short movie a year until someone wow. from Universal or Paramount or Warner Brothers, someone said, who is this guy doing all the ideas? We need to stop this guy. <laughs> so <laughs> I honestly, because I've been writing since I was three, I have so many ideas that, oh, wouldn't it be scary if this? Ultimately, I, I then kind of you know marry that with the story of characters and trauma and really try and say something about the human condition within any of my stories. Vicious is about grief. Vicious is my, short, my first short film. It's 100% about grief eating you up mm-hmm. and letting it destroy you because you blame yourself for what, something ultimately that wasn't your fault. And I made this short myself. I hadn't directed before, but I had money enough. I saved up money so I could pay crew, I could pay actors, and I did some research and I found the best people I knew that could do the job. I surrounded myself with great people. And then I I went even further with Vicious. I knew it was only going to be put on YouTube once, so I did a deep dive into what day of the week is it best to put something on YouTube, what time of the day is it best to put something on YouTube, where to invest the tiny amount of marketing money that I had, and then I dropped it on YouTube and it was getting thousands of views, tens of thousands of views when it was on BuzzFeed and things like that. Wow. Um, so, yeah, and then it started clocking up millions. And so I suppose, you know, you could say from that perspective that it went viral. Mm-hmm. And I, in the info about section, I put in you know, my background, I put what I'm trying to do. And I said, I've got a feature version of this film. If anyone wants to read it, here's my email. And I put that in the, you know, read more section on YouTube. And that was on there for about six months, and I got three emails in six months. I was surprised because I was mm. expecting to get more. Yeah, but naively so because you know who the hell am I? I just made this one short film, but I put this info on there, and I got three emails, and one of them was from Rat Pack, mm. and Rat Pack, um, you know, production company from back in the day, and they emailed me and. That started my journey to L.A., met with production companies, and I met with an agency. And my short film was enough to get me in the room. If it stands out, if it's good enough and people can see that you can can execute. And I think that is 100% the main thing. It is not just about making someone jump, although... That 100% gets you halfway. It's David Sandberg, for example, you know, one of my favorite people. He's an incredible person. And Lights Out was one of the things that inspired Vicious, my first short film. And the rest is, I think, being in the room, having the passion for it and having a story to back up the fright. What I've seen and what I've learned is if you can genuinely execute scary, mm-hmm. And it has meaning behind it. It has story and it has character. And true fear does come from character and story. Then people will take you seriously. But first, you need to prove you can do it. Mm. And that's the hardest thing. Because ultimately, people keep saying, you know, if you want to make movies, go and do it. You've got your phone. Just go and do it. Yeah. And that is 100% what I would say everyone would should do. But don't put your first film online. Right. Make, you know, practice. Do the, the Tarantino, you know, method go and make as many as you can until you've got it right and then when you're happy with one show it to a bunch of people get critiques throw it out do it again and keep going until ultimately you have a movie that follows the pixar model where Mm. it's tested and tested and tested and tested until most people found this scary most people related to this most Mm. people got something out of this story 
and this is you know the great thing about the offering is that just the depth of the characters each one is sacrificing their own self in order to move forward and to overcome their own personal demons this is this is the point it's it's not just about making people jump if it was everyone would be doing it yeah but to that i came to la i met with people and i started developing various projects around town with some of my all-time heroes and I had I just felt like I'd won the lottery. Whoa. I was so unbelievably lucky, right place, right time with the right material. And then COVID hit and I was sent back to square one because everything stopped. But there was a couple of production companies that were still pushing and Millennium were one. Mm. And, you know, they were in prep for the next Expendables. And so, yes, they just finished Till Death and they were looking to make a a horror movie, a Jewish horror movie to be specific. And they had this great script, which was originally called Abizu. Mm -hmm. Abizu is not a Jewish demon for anyone who knows her. She's very, very old, this prolific creature. Uh, for all we know, she could be Lilith herself. Mm. She goes back way, way, way back. And I had always been inspired by this female demon called Abizu. And then I, this script came through my agents and then I realized it was a Jewish script as well. And this is something that I'd seen the vigil and this is something that was new, but also old because Jewish horror goes back. Jewish horror inspired Frankenstein. Really? Like the golem. Oh, the, the golem, golem is of course. Frankenstein. Whoa. And, you know, I mean, also the golem is the first horror franchise of all time. It became, you know, in this is 1915. Mm. They made three golem movies before Nosferatu was you know was even a thing i think the third one was made the same year as nosferatu wow. but this is actually that there probably are other you know silent uh, the silent film era there were so many that were lost even nosferatu was almost a lost film mm -hmm. and you know everyone so glad it wasn't but the golem is the only one we know maybe there's more but jewish stories go back so far and they're so rich there's so much depth so much we don't understand about these that really mystical ritualistic cult tales yeah so this paired two things that i loved and then as i was reading the script i realized this is a writer who really knows how to how to write a traumatic story and it was it was really unsettling i wanted it to be more scary that was the first thing i came on board and said we're going you know we are pushing for this to be scarier and obviously, in order to do that, I had to get to know Hank and where the fear came from, because I didn't want to just bring in jumps. I didn't want to just bring in a, hey, wouldn't it be scary if at one point a train smashes through the house? No, it wouldn't be. It's nothing to do with the story. Right. So, so I worked closely with the guys and I was, we were in script rewrites and me working with Hank and the producers for about eight months before we went into pre-production, two months of pre-production. And then we shot in uh, January, 2021. Very cool. Well, I think, um, yeah. And I spoke to Keith Thomas when the vigil came out and uh, I was, I had no idea that there was that much mythology for lack of a better term um, in terms of, you know, Judaic demonology or that there was that much history and that many beliefs. Cause it's like, it's rarely talked about because you typically associate, you know, demons and Satan with Christianity. And like, for the most part, every exorcism movie has been Christian. Every demonic movie for the most part has been Christian, but there is just such a wealth of material from Judaism. And I feel like people are starting to get hip to that and scratch the surface. You know, there's the vigil, there's your movie up, but like it blew my mind when you said that it, it goes back to the original horror because yeah, of course, Frankenstein is a golem story. So yeah. yeah, there's, there's so much more there, you know, and I feel like you're in a place where you could start like a Judaic conjuring universe. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fantastic. The I conjuring. So. Sorry. I couldn't help it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm um, half Jewish. I can get away with it. <laughs> okay, that's good. I was going to say, I have to lean on someone who's Jewish to um, to know if that's overstepping the mark. But I think that you're, you're completely right. And I think people are, hopefully people are now waking up to the fact that they, people who know what, um, what they're talking about are aware that there is an enormous amount of Jewish folk yep. horror. And that you just fear itself. 
goes back to our, you know, our innate sense of dying and what that is and the unknown and the fact that our brain's job is essentially keep us alive. Yeah. So of course it's going to look for things that can hurt us. And this is the whole creepy versus threat um, conundrum I always play with because ultimately things that are threatening, you know what to do with them. You run or you fight mm, mm-hmm. or if you're unlucky, you freeze. Yeah. But if it's uncanny or if it's unsettling, this is something where the brain thinks, well, there could be a threat, but I can't figure out what it is. Right. There's definitely not something There's, you know, there's, it's not right. It's uncanny but I valley. I can't work out what it is. Exactly that. So within, you know, within folklore and within, you know, going back to original fear, just pulling those threads and seeing what really unsettles people, especially today, mm-hmm. because I think if you go back, go back thousands of years, of course, we were you know, being hunted by wild animals. And a comedian once said, in today's society, how privileged do you have to be to pay someone to scare you? Hmm. Interesting. And I 100% get behind that. Because I think there are many areas of the world where people aren't watching horror because they're living it. Yeah. And I think this is also why horror should be saying something about the human condition or teaching us something or allowing us into a world where, and I think, again, the offering speaks to a world that we've maybe only seen in mainstream Mm -hmm. in something like maybe Unorthodox, the the Netflix show. Oh, right. Or maybe The Vigil. And I think it, it shows one side of the Hasidic community, for example, it doesn't necessarily show you the other sides. And I think that the viewpoints are different. There are very, very disparate tales to tell within the Jewish community. So it it was just fascinating to just pull at those threads to talk about fear, to find out where all this comes from. And yeah, I really do hope there's a lot more to come. Yeah. I feel like you're raising an interesting point about horror being a genre that's very powerful for metaphor, even when it's not direct. Like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was about Vietnam. You can't tell by watching it, but you could tell there was a there was a real energy that was very real and very raw at the heart of it. It came from something that was that was real. And I forgot what last last house on the left was related to something else, seemingly unrelated to that story. But it was about some really awful time period in America. I forgot the details, but they channeled that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the point. I think they're also now, I can't think of of a lot of examples of, of, you know, maybe uh, movies around the kind of the 50s, 60s, 70s that were kind of um, theme pieces. So I Mm -hmm. would call something like um, Get Out. Yeah. That's clearly about something. Oh, yeah. Before before it's a it's an entertainment movie or before it's about anything else it's really a message movie and i think this is really important and i think maybe it's come out of the fact that messages are being lost in films especially in horror movies now a lot of people are just video nasties maybe started this movement where people were just exploitative Mm -hmm. in their filmmaking and they were thinking this is what people want but ultimately it's kind of like um you know, eating fast food all the time. You need you need some veg in there. Yeah. You can kind of hide broccoli in that burger or something. Then then you're able to kind of get the best of both worlds. But 100, <laughs> percent you know, I think that there's the meaning and the metaphor and the themes. It's paramount. Yeah. Especially in horror, and it's the one area where we're able to be open mm-hmm. and we're able to kind of go in and almost be vulnerable. We are vulnerable, so it opens up our minds to hopefully more ideas about the human condition. Yeah. And I feel like with your movie, the interesting thing is you know that there's a real metaphor there and there's a real meaning and there's a big truth about the human condition, but it is entirely up for interpretation. And I feel like the beauty of something like that is people project their own meaning into the movie, you know? Um, So I'm wondering, was that intentional for you to craft something that people would project their own meaning into? All right. What were the, how were you approach? How did you do that? Like what are the the keys to (laughs) crafting something that is not so blatantly metaphorical of something so specific, but allows the space around it where people would be able to relate to it, but then project their own, you know, deeply sacred or intimate meaning into it. I mean, that sounds like a real balancing act. It's, I think there's probably two ways of coming at it. I would guarantee someone like um, David Lynch is just able to just craft that, and that's his first draft. And he knows it's got meaning. 
No, the meditator. What it is. And yeah, and no one else knows what it is. But I think that I come at it from the opposite side and I overwrite. And, you know, as does Hank. So we worked very, very carefully on putting in everything. And it was very clear what everything meant to us, mainly to him, because I was trying to figure out what it was for him. But then uh, I likened it to either burying it or playing that game of Kaplunk, where one by one you just pull out those sticks and the marbles fall. Right. And finally you're left with just the minimum amount of sticks. And it means that you can almost see the marble from multiple angles. Well, that's the way I kind of likened it to, um, to Hank. And being confident to bury things. There's a very strange thing that happens that I've noticed in, in films a lot, not just mine, in other films that I've seen people talk about is that you can write a dialogue scene or you can write something very specific that gives the scene meaning and then cut it and the meaning still remains somehow mm. even if the line has been taken out completely and that's fascinating and i think it's i i don't know why it could just be the 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 feeling i don't know but mm. you know there's some really specific examples uh where where it's amazing that you just think, oh, they definitely said that. I remember them saying that. And you go back and you watch and you just, you can't believe that they mm. never said anything of the sort. That was your interpretation of the scene. It didn't need to be said. Wow. And I think that's the point. You know, more is said in not talking. As Michael Caine always says, just people will read into it. Mm -hmm. What you're doing on your face. You don't need to say the line. I love another example is that when you are shooting a movie in the woods and you want to show two hunters and, you know, all fear is rising and twig snaps and then you cut to an image of a deer that was eating and now the deer swings its head back and looks over its shoulder. Mm -hmm. You don't talk to the deer beforehand and say, right, so what's happening in your <laughs> life at the moment is, you know, you've lost your wife and, you know, you're late for school and then, you know, you know, think of all this fear. What you do is you just make a noise and it just turns. Now, right. that deer, that shot of that deer may have been many things. The deer may have been happy the sound rather than afraid but we will put on whatever it is that, that continues the through line of what we want it to be and again with the the uncanny valley and within horror my favorite thing about horror is the fact that you're already afraid before you go and see the movie i remember that pe this is what um freaking was saying about the exorcist the fact that that was the best thing. People were hearing the rumors of the exorcist playing in theaters and people were terrified and they were being blessed before they went in. Whoa. And that's, that's, that's where you want to be. When you buy a ticket to a horror movie or sorry, I feel like I'm dating myself to when I wasn't even alive, but <laughs> when you, you know, sign in to watch a horror movie, you're signing up to be afraid. Mm -hmm. So you're already on the back foot. And then after that, it's just a case of, just let the audience do the work for you. Just less is more. Yeah. And then it was interesting because talking of less is more, the monster in Abizu, or what she kind of became more of a monster than a demon in some senses, she became a creature. Originally, it was going to be this really dark, almost completely hidden shape in the darkness. And then we realized we were able to do it practical, which I absolutely adore. Nice. So we came up with this fantastic practical effect that we could do on the day and actually have a quote unquote real demon in front of the cast and to shoot a real demon. And then I think this is the best compliment I ever had and I probably ever will get from the studios. When they saw the director's cut of the movie, they gave us more money to... Whoa create a creature a lot more money to create an incredible creature to make this the cinematic hit that they wanted it to be wow and my my team and everyone knew that this i mean this just doesn't happen and they but they loved they loved the director's cut although the director's cut was obviously slightly longer the studio cut shorter but they loved it and they doubled down and they said we're going to bring on you know, the team behind things like hellboy to create Abizu herself, Whoa. and that was such an exhilarating experience to be able to design something that we could show and that we could really hit people with. And ultimately, some people will find it less scary because we're showing you the monster. And when you sh when you see the monster, you know what to do. You know how to fight. You know what to do. Run away or or any of these things. 
So some people will find it less scary. Other people will find it more of a roller coaster. And that enabled us, myself in the studio, to really hit that cinematic middle ground where people can go in. They can see this as a mainstream, very commercial horror movie that they can have fun with. They could also see it, as you said earlier, a much deeper drama that's not really about the monster. Mm -hmm. And it's actually about lies, deceit, sacrifice, returning to family and doing the right thing and remembering where you're from. Faith. Yeah. I liked that there was a creature in it. Like I'm sick and tired of not seeing go. anything. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a uh, there's a balance. You don't want to show too much of it. You don't want to put it in too harsh lighting because then you can kind of see the seams. And you know, I feel like the balance there was great. But that's a that's an awesome story. Like, it's really cool that they and I love that they did it. They they and I don't know if this was at your insistence, but they they decided to go practical because that makes all the difference nowadays. And I think that's what made it powerful. We're tired of CGI monsters more than anything. Cause you, you, it's not, it's not believable. Your mind's eye knows that that's not something that exists in the third dimension and it doesn't take it seriously. It's just not as scary. So um, that's awesome that you were able to get a really, really cool practical demon. Uh, who has it now? I'm always curious what happens to the props. Does the effects house have it? Were you able to keep it? I'm still trying to get it. The effect house currently have it, but uh, hopefully, hopefully, I'll be able to get my hands on it at some point. I still have, in fact, well, people can't see this, but um, I can show you, and you can describe it um, audibly if you want to. I still have my original. Uh, I made this so that the uh, the team could see what was in my mind. Oh wow! Oh, so uh, it's so like a maquette. I made this for. Uh, yeah, it's like a mini bust. Um, of yeah, the so demon. it's basically like it didn't it didn't have a jaw when I made it. I I was looking at this thing from the perspective of it doesn't need teeth to feed. Yeah. And then it, it developed from there. But also, the, actually, what I really love about it is if you zoom in, if you look closely, there are still symbols and uh, circles and sigils carved into the bone on its face. So oh, that's if you're cool. brave enough to go back and pause the movie, <laughs> uh, it's got... It's got symbols carved into its skull. They're rituals that keep it alive, keep it suffering. People that have trapped it over the years have done all these. The, even Abizu herself has a backstory that was written for this movie. So I really do hope that the um, the conjuring uh, continues <laughs> because Me it too. would be fantastic to to kind of dive deeper into into Abizu and see her history and see where she came from and even show the binding of Isaac, you know, in its full glory, because that's one of the things that inspired this. That's the point of the movie. This isn't, you know, a possession movie. This isn't an exorcism movie. Mm -hmm. This is a binding movie. Right. And it was inspired by Caravaggio's binding of Isaac and the, the, and the binding of Isaac story. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cause the story itself felt not necessarily familiar, but it felt like an ancient text or an ancient truth or base. Like there was, there was um, seemingly like a uh, prodigal son element to it as well you know it felt like it Absolutely. was you know deep mythological truths about hum humankind behind it um what was your research process like when it came to demonic mythology do you uh you get into any texts oh, wow. that you were like all right i probably shouldn't open this like a necronomicon <laughs> or anything like what oh, was absolutely yeah in fact yeah. Yeah, i've got i've yeah i've got one of the ne i've got many of the kind of necronomicon uh collections anything i could get my hands on so, as I said, I'm a student of fear. So I've been collecting anything to read, anything to watch, anything to dive into for as long as I can remember. And then I didn't know an awful lot about Jewish mythology and the folklores that Hank taught me about. So when I came onto this project, I knew that I was about to direct a very Jewish film and it was important that it needed to be authentic and grounded. So all of my research turned to what it means to be Jewish and everything Judaic and everything Hasidic. And look, I, I mean, I learned an in incredible amount and I'm so glad because I, I suppose the demonology was, was the easier side because I've been re reading that for years. And um, in fact, actually, uh, here's a great book um, by uh, Rudolf Otto, the idea of the holy Ooh. for those who want to, dive deeper into horror and religion Interesting. and demonolo demonology. But there's, I mean, there's fantastic books um, out there on all this, but 
I've been reading up on that for years and years. So I had my list of demons that I wanted to look at further. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then this, this script came in, uh, like I said, called a Bizu, just named after the demon that I was desperate to do a story on. And it was, yeah, it was incredible. Wow, that's really, really cool. So you, you've talked a few times about being a student of fear. What, what, has your been a, your, what is your approach to having an education, being a scholar of fright? What, what did that look like for you? How were you able to educate yourself? I don't think the first years were me trying to educate myself. I think early on in my life, I was very afraid. And I did have things that I needed to reflect on and overcome. So we all have fear in our life. And I think if you're going to write horror, you need to be brave enough to face your own fears. I was brave enough to face my nightmares. And I think Del Toro once said he used to have nightmares as a child and he told his dreams or he told one of the demons in his dreams that if I write your stories, will you leave me alone? Yes, yeah, so you've heard the story. And um, so, yes, please, anyone listening, please forgive me if I got that slightly incorrect. But basically, I, I didn't know who Del Toro was when I was young. I was too young to know who he was, but I, I did a similar thing. I was having lots of restless nights and I was afraid. So I started writing them down so I could show my parents what was going on to try and get help. And that's where I suppose a fascination started to grow because ultimately I was safe. Apart from so far, luckily, only three times I've been woken up by my partner at the time mm. uh, because I was choking in my sleep. Oh. By the. There's one recurring villain who plagues my nightmares occasionally, and sometimes she will show up and choke me. And luckily, those few times um, I was with a partner who was able to wake me up. Wow. Because. I was choking in my sleep. Okay. So you've had some real fear-driven oh, yeah. experiences. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that Nightmare on Elm Street was inspired by a real story. And it is pretty scary to think that ultimately, you know, I tell as many people as I can, if I just, if, if I die in my sleep, go looking for whoever this ghost is because she's very real Whoa. and very scary. But hopefully that's not how I'll go. And I don't think it was me searching for fear for a long time. It came later when I started playing with it and started enjoying ghost houses at theme parks. And I would be able to, you know, I was inspired by my English teacher in school who would encourage me to write what I was best at writing. Mm -hmm. And I remember him saying at one point at a kind of a parent's evening, he said to my parents that he needs to stop writing scary stories now because I'm, we're all getting a little bit afraid of, wow. of this young child writing scary stories but i don't know i think it may it, it'll be a collection of things watching scary stories um when i was too young found vhs tapes of anything i could get my hands on i think one of the earliest vhs tapes i got my hands on which i was obsessed with was creep show 2 and ultimately i'd read you know the exorcist and i'd read any books i could get my hands on i had mr james I had Poe, I had Lovecraft, obviously Stephen King, and I think I read The Shining a dozen or so times before I was 10. Whoa. Um, so I, I never really looked at it as an education. I looked at it as fun. But it was actually ultimately, it was only later that I really understood a lot of the things that I was watching or reading. Mm -hmm. That's when they became really scary. So I remember the first time I watched of all films, Cannibal Holocaust. And I remembered, oh, this is so gory, it's disgusting, it's so much fun, because I was, I don't know, 13. <laughs> but re-watching that as an adult, it's it's a completely traumatizing film. It's so insane. And, um, I think with all these films, this is the great thing about stories in general. The greatest stories, they stand the test of time because they change as you get older. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You can go back and you can read them, and they mean different things. You can go back and you can read Hansel and Gretel from someone else's perspective. You're no longer one of the children. You might be the witch. Yeah, yeah. And I think it, it's just, again, it all harkers back to um, the human condition in itself and how fascinating I think we are. Because 
Are trees afraid? Mm. Is fear something that we've just made up? Is, it, is fear just something we completely make up in order to just to survive? Mm. That's a good question. It, uh, fear, is, fear is endlessly interesting. And uh, I hope that I never figure out the answers because I think if I do, I'll stop getting ideas. Mm. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, like just man's exploration of fear, I think. Channel, channeling that into horror movies, you're going to make some good horror. Yeah. Although I would, um, I would say also women's exploration of fear because Shirley Jackson. Is oh no, one I of meant the best mankind, but of yeah, all yeah, men and women, yeah, every yeah. all genders. Yeah, I meant mankind. Sorry, I got a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, I think yeah. yeah, it is. It's incredible, and yeah, and long may it continue. Yeah. Yeah, it's that example you just cited about parent-teacher conference. The exact same thing happened to me, but I would draw pictures of monsters. I was at this very pretentious public nice. school that will remain nameless. Let's just say it's called Dalton. Um, <laughs> I was there like first and second <laughs> grade. And um, yeah, I had uh, I had these wonderful art teachers and I would make, I would sculpt these really elaborate monsters and draw these really elaborate monsters. Sometimes it got a little bloody. Um, I think I was like six, seven. And then it, it like a, the, the teachers contacted my parents. Like, he's got to stop drawing monsters. It's scaring the other students. And then I did. And then the art teachers got really upset. And I think one of them quit because they're like, oh, they're limiting the expression of this child. But like, yeah, since I was a kid, for me, it was so normal. And it worried that some teachers suck. Some are amazing, though. But uh, yeah, same thing happened to me. It's pretty cool. <laughs> That's, I, I kind of want to see these images now. Definitely send them through. I got to, so yeah, I have to find them. The I have some clay sculptures at, uh, in my mom's house, but uh, yeah, I got to, I got to find all those old images. Yeah. Cause there was, there was some elaborate stuff in there for sure. Um, how are you doing on time? Do you have like another 10 minutes maybe? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I've yeah? got a, I've got a meeting at uh, six my time. So yeah, in 20, just under 20 minutes. Okay. Perfect. So I've got 10, 15. Okay, cool. Um, so we were talking earlier on set about how you can have a great cast, you can have a great crew, great everything, but things inevitably will go wrong. So what was your experience with dealing with the kind of chaotic elements of getting the offering made? I think it's a great question. And I think that ultimately what we said earlier, just, just staying calm and remembering what's true to the story. What are the main elements that you need to get out of the space you're in, in order to continue to tell the story. Things will go wrong and things will change very quickly. It's fantastic if you've got a great team and a great crew around you because everyone is is pushing forward to, towards the same goal. Mm -hmm. But ultimately just remaining calm and knowing exactly what you need to get. If you've got your shot list, I storyboard everything. So, you know, I, I love to draw and if I can work with storyboard artists as well, even better. And just absolute preparation and then that's that's your ideal but going in knowing full well most of this won't happen or just you know just to mm. just to relieve yourself of, of attempting to reach perfection just go in if, if you get everything that's incredible but at the same time you're going to get to places and realize this isn't working exactly how i wanted it now i'm seeing it or the actor isn't able to do something specific um Wait, you want me to jump 20 feet? You know I can't do that, right? So these these things that ultimately continue to happen. And then, yes, on the um, the fateful day, when the one day that we went over was the day that we were trying to have these doors explode outwards. And one of them kept getting stuck. And we only had, I think, about 10 sheets of sugar glass. So every time we did one, one sheet would go. And then we would have to put the, you know another sheet back in and so on and so forth. And we ended up using every sheet of glass to get those doors to actually smash. Oh, but when that happened, I think when we got to the seventh or eighth take, and I think that might have been the longest amount of takes we did on anything, it got to the point where we, in order to get the shot, we ditched the scene that preceded that shot. I would say the scene, the kind of the moment that preceded that shot. So for those who have seen the movie, there's a bit where uh, Haim comes over to Hamish and Arthur and he basically says that we haven't got time for this. OK, you know, we, we need to move. And he's just got this underlying unnerving sense. There's something wrong. 
Meanwhile, out in the corridor, the back door opens slightly by a bizu, and a breeze comes in, blowing some leaves along the floor, and the ash that protects the room that they've put in the room blows underneath mm. the door to the morgue, which gives a bizu the opportunity to explode mm. those doors mm. open. And Hyam kind of catches a glimpse of this wind, turns to the doors, and then they smash open. But ultimately, we chose getting the doors over picking up that moment of the kind of breeze coming through the floor and building the atmosphere there, which I 100% miss. I wish we could have got it, but we had a choice. Either we lose the doors mm-hmm. and we move on and we get that, or we know full well that what the catalyst for the rest of the scene is, is the explosion of the doors. Mm-hmm. So we stuck with the doors. Got it. So throughout your career, were there any books or resources or anything that was particularly helpful for you, either from a creative perspective, storytelling perspective, or career perspective, like books or anything like that? Everything on film education that you can get your hands on. I remember one person once said, just read all the books, then forget them. Don't, <laughs> you know, buy, don't become, don't just read, you know, James Cameron's biography and then just do James Cameron right. because that's already done. The most important thing was really leading into what zhuzh you bring into the project. What is it that makes this you? What's your style? And I think you only find out that as you go. What is it that you're really good at? I think, again, I learned, I think this was from a magician on a TV show or something years ago. They said that, you know, good magicians are taught early. Master one trick Mm. first. Pick one trick and get really good at it. Get the best in the world at that one trick, then move on. Interesting. And that's the way I see it with what I'm trying to do. I'm really trying to lean into, I'll see an image, I'll hear a piece of music, or I'll play a video game, uh, you know, Silent Hills PT, for example, one of the best games ever made. And I'll lean into what really touches me about what it is, and just experiment around that. So if you're, you know, to, to fellow filmmakers or writers or anyone, bring a team together, whoever you are. If you want to make movies or you want to be in movies, just bring a team together who can make that happen around you. Yeah. You've got the, you've got the ability to seek out the best people and just work with other people. This is all collaboration. And then, you know, be open because ultimately people are going to bring you some ideas you hate, but are better. And I think that's the main thing is that when you're making a movie that's not just for you, you have to be aware, leave your ego at the door. Yeah. Well, I feel like that's a perfect place to end on. Uh, Oliver, this was this was a real treat. There's so much information to be downloaded from this conversation. So thank you. I can sum up by saying there's plenty more fear coming your way. <laughs> All right. Great place to end. Oliver, thank you again. This was, this was a real privilege. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was awesome. Here are some key takeaways from this conversation with Oliver Park. Number one, build fear through character and story. The offering excels at character development, with each character displaying a significant amount of depth and a well-crafted backstory. This contributes greatly to the film's effectiveness, as understanding the characters leads to caring for them. And when you care for the characters, you empathize with their struggles, and that empathy ultimately transforms into fear for their well-being, which is ultimately what can make your movie genuinely scary. Number two, Be flexible and foster a secure atmosphere for your actors. The acting in the offering is really impressive, especially considering it's Oliver's first feature. He emphasizes the importance of creating a secure environment for his actors, which primarily involves giving them the space and time they require and protecting them from on-set chaos. This is achieved by briefing the crew beforehand and closely collaborating with your AD regarding set pacing, while also advocating for more time when necessary. Particularly in low-budget films, there's often pressure to move at a very rapid clip. But the subtle details that can make or break a movie, such as performance nuances, require time, and these are ultimately worth the investment. Learn to create the space needed for actors to deliver their best work, even when working at a fast pace. Number three, 
stay closely connected with the story to make adjustments during production. Oliver mentioned that several unexpected events occurred while making the offering, but instead of panicking, he managed to bounce back because of his deep understanding of the story. Relying too heavily on specific scenes, pieces of dialogue, or set pieces can make your movie vulnerable to collapse if things don't go as planned. To build resilience, become so intimately familiar with your story that you can quickly come up with alternative solutions that still remain true to the story's core. This will give you adaptability and allow you to turn on a dime and rewrite scenes, dialogue, etc. when things inevitably go wrong on set. Number four. Scares, story, character. The magic solution. Oliver offered an extremely powerful distillation of principles for producing a powerful horror short. This is a real nugget of gold, so I'd write this one down. He stated that people will take you seriously if you can create fear, build great characters, and have a solid story underneath it all. This may sound simple, but it's very difficult to achieve, and one of the main challenges of horror filmmaking. Watch Oliver's short Vicious, as well as the shorts of Parker Finn and David Sandberg for examples of this. Anyway guys, thank you as always for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, why not share it with your friends and family on social media? Don't forget to follow the show on Instagram at I'm Nick Taylor, that's I am Nick Taylor, and on Twitter at the same handle. Thanks again for listening to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. Hey guys, one last thing before you head off, and this is The Howl. How would you like a monthly newsletter featuring a recap of the latest horror news, my personal movie recommendations, updates from the show, and cool stuff I've recently discovered? If this sounds like something you'd enjoy, sign up for my monthly email newsletter, The Howl, today. You can sign up for The Howl by visiting nicktaylor.com slash The Howl. That's nicktaylor.com slash The Howl. <laughs>